I was like, so why do people do that? You know, why do they care about environmental protection? And that professor told me, oh, it's because they are stupid. Because <laughs> for him, you know, people were more economical, so they were paying more to get the same product. That does not make sense. You know, they are just <laughs> idiots. Basically. But during my master, I kind of realized, I mean, we already have so many great technologies. Like we, we don't really need more uh, to solve climate change issue. The science is there. What is missing is like these technologies, they do not necessarily make it to the market. And I wanted to understand that a bit more. So that's why I, I actually did a PhD in economics. Like, what are you doing? Like putting a function, like this function with like two goods and like, then you're saying that people decide based on that, that like seems so out of the place. And as the boys were saying, like also people being just selfish, not interacting with their environment, not interacting with others. Like the first time you're exposed and the knowledge also that you have before getting to economics is like, what's the use of this? But then, then like, and I think both of us got onto this fast and also you, Quentin, I think like we've already talked about it. Slowly by slowly, you start seeing like, wait, there's actually a lot of good things about it. And as Boris was very well saying, um, you can get a lot of amazing insights You can go in physics and then you're like, well, when you try to explain the movement of planets, you are, we are, you are with general relativity, but indeed other, it, it does not explain everything, right? If you go at the subatomic level and you want to explain the neutron, proton, quarks behavior, you have another theory. Basically in different contexts, you will apply different models that fits well the, the situation. Well, then you have Welcome to this fourth episode of the Unbiased Podcast, your podcast about women and men of science, and more specifically about scientific research in economics. Today, I'm super happy to have two very good friends with us. So Charles Ayubi, who has a PhD in economics from EPFL, who is a fellow researcher at Harvard University today, and uh, Boris Thum, who has uh, also a PhD in economics from uh, EPFL, but who is also an environmental engineer. And uh, hi, guys. How, how are you both doing? Hi. Great, hi. great, great. What about you? Uh, doing great. Super happy to be here to, to discuss about this very exciting topic of, of utility functions and of, of models in economics. So, so really glad to be with you two who are very knowledgeable on those topics, who have papers exactly on, on those matters. So, so as Charles was already here, we are, we are not going uh, on the podcast. We are not going to, to present him today. There is the other video, but I'm, I'm sure the audience will, will know a bit more about you, Boris, and what's your background? What's, what led you to, to, to go in economics, which is really something that's always, as Alice said in the, the, one of the podcasts before, it's, for many people, it's, a, it's, it's not a straight line, and it's interesting to see. And, uh, indeed, indeed, yeah. it was not a straight line. And, and first, let me say thanks a lot for the invita invitation. I mean, I, I've been following your, your channel for a long time, and I I really enjoy what you're doing, like popularizing science and, and uh, economic research. Uh, you do a great job. So very happy to, to be here today and discuss about, about this important topic that are economic assumptions and more economic assumptions. And we'll go to that a bit later, I guess. Uh, so about me, yeah. I'm, so I'm from France. I grew up in the Alps, in the, in the mountains. So, you know, I used to spend my time, my childhood in the mountain, in the forest. Uh, I enjoy nature. I'm passionate about environmental protection. So... Like I first did a, a bachelor in environmental sciences and uh, then a master in uh, sustainability, energy management, sustainability. And back, back then my, my objective, you know, I was a bit naive. Uh, my objective was to kind of invent this great technology where that would provide like clean energy to the world, you know, cheap and amazing technology. But during my master, I kind of realized, I mean, we already have so many great technologies. Like we, we don't really need more. Uh, to solve climate change issue. The science is there. What is missing is like these technologies, they do not necessarily make it to the market. And I wanted to understand that a bit more. So that's why I, I actually did a PhD in economics. And like coming from, um, you know, passionate about environmental protection, coming from environmental science, I was quite critical about um, economics and the assumption be behind the economic model. Like, uh, 
selfish agents, uh, rational agents, maximizing their cost option, like all these assumptions for, for me, that was like, what's that? I mean, so I really was curious to understand more about it and did this PhD in economics. And that was one of the best decisions of my life because actually I, I was hooked by economics. I found it fascinating and till today I, I love uh, doing economic research. That's and we met there also. It was a great. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> that's definitely the best part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The three of us did, uh, so for the audience, we did uh, doctoral school together. So we met there. We, we, we studied uh, math, basically, in different forms uh, over the night. And, and, and that, uh, that was super cool. That was really great indeed meeting you. So very, very great introduction and i mean it's it's very interesting as you say that's really the limitation seems not to be in that in this big topic which is environment seems not to be in the the technology but rather in the hands of the the humans and their incentive and i think that that's very important that it made me think about one paper that i mentioned also uh, uh on the on the podcast by the simon scheidegger among other and uh, and uh, uh, larry kotlikoff who show also that we could do a, a, a CO2 taxation scheme that, that would work for everyone, that, that would help because each generation is selfish and don't want to pay today to benefit the next generation when they are not on this earth anymore. And that was really at the core. It's not an issue of how, how you, you tax CO2. It's really an issue of how you manage to pr suggest a taxation scheme where everybody will, will be happy and uh, and and decide Except to thing. pay yeah exactly yeah it's true so so very interesting and, and you mentioned what something that's that's key so later on we will talk about one of your joint paper which is really about uh, about the topic we, we are going to discuss today but i think before that let's take really the core or one of the key things in economics is really this view of the individuals as homo economicus it's really like the the human beings in the model uh, economic model are really just driven by by basically maximizing their 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 utility and their utility which is a measure of how happy they are and basically in the basic model it only depends or is, it's only a function as how many goods you have nothing else you don't care about others you don't care about the environment you don't care about anything you just want to have as many as possible, as uh, the largest quantity possible of, of the goods available in the economy. And, and indeed, this has some, so, some li limitation, I guess, or, or not. What, what do you think about this model as of today? Uh, if I can ask broadly, just to, to comment on, on this, this big topic, that uh, an assumption that's some, sometimes criticized and, and viewed as very, like, with big limitation from outside, but but yeah, what do you think? Maybe maybe you can go first, Boris. Like, uh... yeah, well, for sure, it's not a great representation of human being. Uh, I mean, obviously, we know, like all economists know, that uh, humans are not selfish and they don't maximize this utility. Like, like we know that. Like, I actually, obviously, like we, you know, we share, we some, we cooperate with each other. I mean, the fact that we have a society. Uh, means that we co cooperate and, and that we are not only interested in ourselves. And obviously we have kids, you know, you mentioned before that uh, we don't care about future generation, that that's not totally true because I mean, when you have kids and all that, you want to preserve the environment and then you have many instances or examples showing that even if it's not, you're not related to the person, you know, you care about, about the future somehow. Uh, but still like, I, I would say that's that's not the, the point of an economic model economic model it's it's like uh we, we often mention this analogy of a, of a map uh where like a map you know it does not need to be faithful to reality to provide some insight and a model it's it's the same another uh, good example that i like it's um, like a fable like a, this short story you know in this short story you have characters that could be you know, sometimes it's animals that represent human traits like uh, like the king you know is the lion this kind of thing and so it's not faithful to IT, but still, at the end, there is a moral. You know, there is a lesson, and and that's the, that's the point with economic model. You have some assumption. It's, it does not mean to represent perfect reality, but like it can give you some insights about what is the world. And I think that's the main point about uh, economic modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know if I, I, I can add something on that. One thing I want to say, I mean, following on what Boris was saying just before, um, on what like brought us to. I'm also an engineer. 
uh, like who decided to come to economics for similar motivations. Actually, I was also very interested in the environmental problem. And, um, and, and I think the first attitude is the one that Boris was saying is like, what is this? I don't know if we are allowed to use, but what is this mess? Like, let's not use bad words. Uh, uh, like, yeah, really? it's so difficult for me not to use the bad words too. Uh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> like, seriously, guys, like economists, like, like, what are you doing? Like, putting a function, like this function with like two goods and like, then you're saying that people decide based on that, that like seems so out of the place. And as the boys were saying, like also people being just selfish, not interacting with their environment, not interacting with others. Like the first time you're exposed and the knowledge also that you have before getting to economics is like, what's the use of this? But then, then like, and I think both of us got onto this fast and also you Quentin, I think like we've already talked about it. Slowly by slowly, you start seeing like, wait, there's actually a lot of good things about it. And as Boris was very well saying, um, you can get a lot of amazing insights. So like today, if you analyze any market, uh, whether it's the oil market, the food, um, like grains, it, it works really well to just like take these simple utilities with selfish people to get what we call a demand function, to know how much people are going to ask for products. For sure, there's like, it's really like when you see, you know, like a curve with a lot of like asperities, but the trend is clear. And that's what the utility function gives you. It's like, yeah, there's of course people who like bought bread to give it to their friends or whatever. They didn't buy it for themselves. But all in all, if you pull it all together, this utility function gives you a good hint of the amount of bread that's going to be bought on the market and the demand for this bread or the demand for uh, the wheat or the demand for oil. And that's what we want to know at the end of the day, because we want to make projection. We want to understand how the market function. So I think it's a great tool. And where Boris and I like we're interested in is like seeing what's the limit of it. Where does it stop to be relevant? And what? so we know what it really represents really well and what doesn't it represent really well. And I think that's where we wanted to go a bit further. So yeah. And like, if I may also build on that, I, I think one, um, like, misconception that people have about economics it's like they think that economists all think that you know the world is like a perfect market and like actually people are selfish are these homo economicus uh, people I think like that's kind of the perception because when you look I don't know in the media and newspaper that that's the perception you have of economic research and actually when you do economic research you realize that's not at all the case. I mean, it, it's kind of, kind of actually the opposite. Like what, what is economic research is actually about the inefficiency in the market, like what, what is not working well. Uh, it's all actually the exception. And actually the world is actually an exception. So it's not even an exception because this uh, this vision of perfect markets, it's it's completely unrealistic and it's we never observe that. So, uh, and economists are obviously well aware of that. Uh, and I think that's a mis misconception that that people that do not do economics have about economists. That's really central and important. I see exactly while teaching at, at university those models, it's exactly what happens after one month or so, or even at, at the end of the semester, people come up, come up and, and might discuss with me like, but this doesn't make sense, right? So, so what, what the hell? What, it, it's, really, it's, it's really limited. You have like very broad assumption, and as you said, uh, as we just discussed. And again, as you said, but it allows those very simple model as allows to replicate actually very well many, many different facts that we observe in reality. So indeed, you can model really precisely. I don't know that one guy will like red pants and the other green ones, but actually does, you don't care about those details if you want to, to model just the, 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 the demand function and the equilibrium on, on the mass market with a, a large variety of people. And also uh, about those simplification, I mean, there, there is the, the, the thing about finding what you call a, a representative agent, right? You, you don't need to have like, you can tell basically in the model, you have a variety of individuals with very different characteristics and things they like, but in the end you can find on average what their behavior. And, and under some assumption, you can get basically a representative agent, the average guy or, or person. And then with just one person with some traits who represent the whole population, you can get the same results as if you have a uh, very heterogeneous population. So again, it allows really to simplify, to be able to, to show and replicate results that will be the same with a very complicated model. So I think it's, it's 
it's it's indeed very yeah, exactly. important like it, it would not be possible like if you want to have a perfect economic model you would need to model each individual each firm each uh, like government and agency and all the relations between them i mean that's that's impossible at least yeah. with uh, like a technology we, we have today maybe one day i don't know but right now it's impossible so we, we need some simplifying assumption uh, the important thing is that this assumption can provide insight and are like good enough in, in a sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you said it i mean one assumption that is often used is this representative agent especially in macro models where you just like end up with like the consumption value for this representative agent. Um, so as you said, it works really well for a lot of like subject or like things you want to get insights about uh, on markets. But again, that's also something, it's funny that you talk about heterogeneity because that's something we work on with Boris, like saying, wait, what's the limit of it? Like, does the model give the same result always if you use a representative agent or if you use heterogeneous agents? And, and, and then like we find actually different things by going for like heterogeneity uh, on some aspects. I mean, I don't know. We're probably going to talk about Yeah, that. like we thought spoiling. <laughs> paper. No, go ahead, go ahead. So, <laughs> no, so like... I, I think that's important. So, so what's, what's this paper that you're referring to? So you have two basically on, on those concepts, right? Uh, we have a few, yeah. yeah we okay, are. so... so uh, of you, <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, like yeah. We, we but let's start with what? that. The, the core is it is it Homo moralis at the core of your uh, of your research? Okay, so would yes, you it is, yeah. would you like first to introduce this this concept of Homo moralis in opposition, kind of, or, or uh, to Homo economicus, who we discuss the limitations? Sure. So um, the the thing is. So we said we know people are, are not selfish. We know they, they are not homo economicus. So the question is, okay, if they are not this homo economicus, what are they actually? Like, imagine you have one preference that would be favored by evolution. You know, what would it be? And actually there are some, I'd say not answer, but uh, um, some, uh, let's say clues about what it could be in a paper in 2013 by Ingelage and uh, Jorgen Weibull where basically they show that the preference that is favored by evolution is what they call homo moralis. And what is it, homo moralis? It's evolution of humans are... only, I guess. Yes, it's, it's about human. Okay. Actually, but this, um, so this model yeah, is- Yeah, it could uh, apply, yeah. Yeah, it's because it's based on evolutionary game theory. And, and evolutionary uh, biology. And yeah, it's, it's <laughs> coming from biology actually. And, and the roots behind that it's, was to study the cooperation between um, animals uh, because they also cooperate. And um, okay, we won't represent animals having preferences, but kind of it's the same uh, behavior. Like it's, it's really always about cooperation. Uh, and so in, in this uh, 2013 paper, they, they found that this homo moralis is, is uh, favored by evolution. And homo moralis, it's individuals that are partly selfish, like the standard homo economicus, and partly moral in what they say a conscience sense. So individuals are asking themselves, what happens if the other is acting like me? Um, mm. And yeah. so we got introduced to this paper with Charles uh, during our study in, in the guest and and like already like first reading we were like wow that's that's so cool because you know there are so much potential for application like it explains a lot of um, real behavior and especially for me uh, that is into environmental protection you know I was I remember once I did a, a summer school in um, in Bergen. And I discussed with a professor there about um, uh, the fact, you know, that individuals can purchase green electricity. You know, you pay a little more on your electricity bill to get electricity produced by renewables. And uh, I was like, so why do people do that? You know, why do they care about environmental protection? And that professor told me, oh, it's because they are stupid. Because <laughs> for him, you know, people were more economic, so they were paying more to get the same product. That does not make sense. You know, they are just <laughs> idiots. So basically. So obviously, no, that's, that's not a good answer for me. But when you think about morality, well, think about it. Like imagine in reals asking themselves, what happens if they act the same way as I do? Mm -hmm. So if everybody is purchasing green electricity, then the electricity mix is renewable. We emit less greenhouse gas, uh, CO2. Climate change is uh, reduced. And so there are less bad impacts. So when you think about it this way, you know, it makes sense. Actually, people will, like with morality, this can expl explain lots of uh, behavior about environmental protection, about uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, we have a paper about Wikipedia and all that. 
And that's, that's kind of uh, why we, we started to be interested in, into that. And that paper that, that we have, it's about environmental protection. And basically we make the assumption that people are this uh, moralis. And the extra assumption, it's also they have different degrees of morality. Everybody, you know, some people are more selfish, some people are more moral. So we have this heterogeneity uh, because it's also something that we observe. We observe lots of heterogeneity of, of behaviors, you know. Uh, Here, some it, people it, will purchase winning see, others do not. How is it distributed in your model? Like 50-50, like a complete extreme, the opposite, on average? Does it change if you, if you have different distribution in this population to have like really polarized or is it just a uniform distribution between I'm completely selfish and I'm completely moral? How is it? We, uh, we allow for like a big diversity of the distributions. Oh. So they're all like uh, distributions between zero and one. So basically the model is adaptable and so you can like match it on what you observe in your population. So like you can have populations with like a lot of highly moral people, a population with uh, like a lot of lowly moral people, you can have a 50-50. Uh, you can have a distribution where it's like uh, only like Dirac, so only like extremes, as you said. Yeah, so yeah. people who are 100% moral, 100%. You could like imagine anything. And you could also have the case that most of economics does, which is just a Dirac on. So like all people are like homo economicus. So a level of morality of zero for everybody. That's also totally feasible with our model. So it offers this flexibility. But to think about that, does it affect the results? Back to the thing we mentioned with the, with the representative agent. In the end, is it the mean of this distribution or the, the expectation that's important? Or does it affect the, 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 the results within a theoretical model? Then we can think in reality if it should affect the results or not. And let's start with that. Yeah. So do, do you want to go, Boris? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it, of, yeah, it does affect the results. Like depending on the distribution of morality, obviously you will have different behaviors, and like basically to have tractable results in this uh, theoretical model, we we make some simplifying assumption, and and still basically mm -hmm. what what would happen like first at the individual scale, is that you will behave in an environmental friendly way if the benefit like if everybody is acting like you weighted by your degree of morality is greater than the cost of like the effort of acting, uh, of performing an environmental friendly task. So for instance, like paying more for uh, green electricity weighted by your degree of selfishness. So that's at the individual level, but then for each individual, you know, it's different depending on their degree of morality, depending on actually the effort for them, depending on the benefit and this benefit, what is important, that they will get, it's, it's really dependent on also their awareness of the environmental issues. So in our paper, we have all this section about uh, policy implication because I mean, that's what we are interested in, you know, like how we can then promote environmental behavior. And an important part actually, it's about education and promoting awareness to increase actually this awareness because even if you're fully moral, if you have no awareness of the environmental issue, you won't. Uh, behave in an environmental friendly way. I mean, if you're not aware of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it depends for each individual. And then when you put all that together, then you have indeed like a different level of cooperation depending on, so the distribution of morality, depending on uh, the effort. Like for instance, if you think of different countries, in some countries, it's more difficult to recycle than in others. So that, that will in, uh, impact the results. So that makes us think about how to design like good recycling system and this, this kind of um, and do you, do you have any idea of what will be the uh, parallel to, to reality in the sense, does this, maybe it's not useful at all, but just as you're, you know the topic, do you have any sense of, of the, the average uh, morality parameter we should use here? For example, compared to this model, should the people be on average like 50-50 between the two? Does it replicate better our behavior? Is it rather we are 90% homo economicus and a bit moral? Um, or, and also, if, if you have an idea about the distribution, does it change between different uh, in reality? So basically just the, the parallel to reality between the parameter and the distribution. But, but. Yeah, I would say it's very difficult to send so should something. I, uh, oh, yeah, please, please, Charles. <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, you, 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 were, you were explaining it really well. Just uh, first, <laughs> I want to go back to like the link with, with um, 
So, so to answer your question, the link with, with what we were saying in the very beginning, remember, like we were saying, utilities are super useful, right? So why are we even bothering, like classical utilities, homo economicus? Yeah. Why are we even bothering to talk about all that, right? Uh, so like, why don't we use just representative agent that's selfish and that's it and everything works. So as Boris was saying, it works really well, but it, it reaches some limits at some point, right? And so that's when you need to create something new to get new insights. So if you think about an, um, a homo economicus agent that is representative, he or she would never buy, uh, as Boris would say, pay more money to buy a green electricity, right? Like you would never do it, except if you're dumb, like, like the professor was saying. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so the question is, why are we doing it then? So like what is amazing, I think, and it, that's a key point about Homo moralis is to say that with such a model, you show that people can systematically and rationally decide to act in a moral way, like thinking about, uh, like thinking about their environment and thinking about other people's behavior, the, which which the the the, the homo moralis, which the homo economicus model doesn't do. It doesn't tell you like. Uh, um, it doesn't give you any possible explanation of why you would think of other people's behavior. Mm -hmm. Then going on the heterogeneity also, if, so it does affect it definitely. Like you see a difference whether you use a representative homo moralis agent also, or if you use a diversity and it does change a lot. So to answer your question, if you look at different countries, so there's like actually a very cool paper uh, showing uh, in QJE published in last year. I don't know, you probably boys remember the names better than I do, but showing that there's a huge heterogeneity within countries. Uh, so across countries and within countries uh, in terms of like uh, uh, altruistic behavior, but also moral, moral behavior. So like people will act differently depending on the country they live in, etc. And so uh, you were saying like, what's the average level? Uh, it depends a lot. So um, mm. Weibel that we were talking about, Professor Jürgen Weibel, uh, is working with University of Zurich to run experiments. And so they already like have some results where like what they do is like they do a lot of like um, experiments where like they just vary some things and they can know if like you're acting out of altruism or out of selfishness or out of mor morality. And they find that out of like five different possible utility functions, the one with the strongest explanatory, like the one that would explain best what people are doing by far is like with the best fit is homo moralis. So it's really a very good explanation actually of human behavior. And it like kind of like confirms the theoretical approach that they had saying that from an evolutionary, theoretical evolutionary perspective, homo moralis is, is the highest planetary power. So like it changes from different places, but it seems that homo moralis is a really good like explanation for people's behavior when it comes to thinking more as a community rather than just mm -hmm. like, do I want apples or pears? Uh, for, yeah. the, for dessert. Yeah, that's uh, that's very for me the fascinating thing with their paper because it was a very theoretical paper mm -hmm. that they found it like you know it's like really math and and you don't want to go into detail about that. I mean it's very difficult math, but then they test it uh, in laboratory and yeah they find that it's it's actually best performs you know it uh, outperforms obviously more economicus but then outperform notions like altruism or many others so. I, th I think that was very interesting to see that. What, what like game? To... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no it, was, it was about like this, uh, you know, you, you ask also, why is it important to have this heterogeneity and, uh, uh, versus this representative agent? I mean, one simple way also to, to see that it's uh, with environmental protection, it's if you have a representative agent or if you have people that are all the same, also like different assumptions, well, then the policy that you need, it's the same for all individuals. You know, you need, for instance, one tax, uh, one CO2 tax, and, and that will work for everybody. But if mm. you have heterogeneity, yeah. you would see that actually, I don't know, the level of the tax will differ depending on the individual. The, um, there will be impl different implications depending on the level of revenue, you know, depending on if you're poor or, or richer, like you, your effort that you can uh, do is different, obviously. So that's, that's where heterogeneity matters, you know, and for this kind of, um, of problem, it, I think it's it's very important to to have it. Yeah, just what what's the game where they uh, what's the setup of the game they are playing for the experiment? Just uh, I'm curious how, to, how how they decide to compare those with the utility function. So, so yeah, what, what what's the setup of the experiment? So, so I mean, I don't know how much your like listeners are um, into like game theory. So we talked about utility, uh, which is a concept that like is independent. Like it's a very old concept in economics. Just like 
maximizing your well-being with this utility. And then like in the post-war period, I mean, probably most of people, your listeners know it, uh, there was like all this development of game theory uh, with like John Nash's uh, impact who got the Nobel Prize in economics uh, in the early 90s. And, and so like this, it's this idea that you interact with others. So with the whole thing about uh, game theory is that like, you're not only thinking about what's good for you, you also think, oh, what's the other going to do? And actually the whole idea of homo moralis is only um, applicable in a way in a setting where you have the other strategy because you need to take into account what the others are doing. You need to think what happens, you need to think what happens if everybody else does like me. And so like answering your question in the model, like to, in order to talk about like, um, um, uh, like to see which utility is more useful, what they do is they make them play different games. So there's coordination games. Uh, so these mm -hmm. are like game theoretical mm -hmm. games, mm -hmm. prisoner's dilemmas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what they see is just like, let's suppose they have um, an altruistic uh, utility they maximize it rationally and they see what would be the behavior. They also like um, uh, what we call is um, uh, calibrate the parameters of altruism uh, and of morality, et cetera, uh, based on like the thing that gives them best explanation. So suppose like we say, okay, they're altruistic. The best uh, parameter that gives like the most fit is like one that says that they are 30% altruistic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they check like, okay, this would explain 70% of the behavior. Then they do the same with homo moralis, like a degree of morality that would explain best the behavior is the morality of like whatever, 40%. And they see that this explains 90% of the behavior. So like that the, the homo moralis setting utility function that you maximize would explain more your behavior in the games that you're playing with other people. So that's, the, um, that's how they do it. I don't know if it answers your question, but no. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I, I see it very clearly. And, and you, you mentioned uh, uh, another approach, which is uh, about fairness, right? It's uh, uh, altruistic behavior. How, how does it differ? What's, so, so it's also based, I guess, on, on, your, on the payoff of the other, right? Or what's the difference with homo moralis and, and does it fit better real life situations? Yeah, so altruistic, actually, it's, it's, um, it's not new in economic literature, obviously, I mean, we know altruism. I, mean, I think it was first mentioned in 74, I mean, in a mathematical way, in a way to represent mm -hmm. that. Uh, Baker, if I remember correctly. Okay. And so the point is like, um, you care about the payoff of the other. I mean, altruism, you know, you care about the other. For, for instance, uh, like if Charles is fully altruistic, does not care at all about himself. He will only care about our payoff. So he will act in a way that maximizes our well-being. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of self selfishness. But your payoff depends on Charles' payoff. Is your the... utility depends on his payoff. So it's two different things. Yeah. Okay. The payoff is what you get. Ah, yeah. So there is the no utility feedback. is what you value. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So mm -hmm. homo for, for homo yeah, economicus, yeah. your payoff is your utility. That's why maybe you're like, because like what you get is what you're happy about. I mean, you might have like value different things differently, but basically your utility is only a function of your payoff. Very good. Well, like in altruism, it's also a function of the payoff of the other dude. I mean, I don't know if you're going to continue. Boris. So in a, in a way, it's like asking yourself, like it's empathy, you know, it's asking yourself. So what happens if like I am in his shoes, you know, mm -hmm. like, like what would happen if I were him? Uh, that, that's kind of the question you, you're wondering. And that, that's why it differs from morality because morality in, the, in this sense, uh, uh, like because morality is like what happens if the other is acting like me? Yeah. So you, you don't really care about his payoff. Actually, you, you care about what is happening to you. You know, you're, you're still kind of selfish in a way, uh, but, but you take into account what happens or when there are all these interactions happening, what happens when, you know, if I do this, this, and the other does this, like, what, what is happening to me? And actually, so maybe, no, no, it's the opposite. Like, what is happening to, to him yeah. <laughs> or her? Maybe, maybe like an illustration example that I, 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 I like to, like, when we were talking with Boris, uh, because I, I, I think, like, it's a very telling, like, very simple example. Suppose we're in a room, and, like, I have, I have some bread and you have some cheese, Okay. And if I'm altruistic, the reason I give you half of my bread is because I think about you. I'm like, oh, Quentin would be so happy to have some bread with his cheese. That's my motivation. If I'm moral, I would say, if, I, like, if everybody gives what they have, I will get cheese from him. Yeah. So like, you're thinking, like, if he gives half of what he has, like I give half of what I have, 
Then we, I would have bread and cheese and he will have, I don't care about what he gets, but I will have bread and cheese. So I prefer to have half a bread and half a cheese than having just a full bread and no cheese. And so like morality thinks of, well, what you get if everybody does like you? So if the other guy gives half of what he has to, uh, while like in altruism, you're thinking about how happy he would be by getting the bread that you give. Uh, and then like you mentioned also, so, so actually in the paper that we were mentioning about the experiment that uh, Weibel and Fair and University of Zurich did, they looked at five different utility functions. So mm -hmm. homo economicus, they looked at altru homo altruisticus, or like altru altruism. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this exists like this way. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they then, need a fancy name like uh, the, Morales. They, or... <laughs> they, yeah, they looked at Morales and then they looked at fairness. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, called, it's called like... Um, inequity aversion or like yep. and so this is just, again another thing is just uh you lose utility when there are people who have much less than others and you so have at, yep. at the end of your utility function you have like the difference the average difference between people so like if i have twice as much as you do this like decreases my utility because i feel like it's so unfair but if the other has more, it's, it, you it's have also, different parameters, it's, it's even worse usually. If I have like very little and the other has a lot, it also decreases my utility even yeah. more because I care about fairness also. So yeah. I have a lower utility because I'm not getting much and because like it's unfair. So it's like mm -hmm. you care about fairness. Yeah, that, that's very important to introduce those because when you, we spoke about homo moralis, it, it feels like indeed it's caring about the other. But that's not the case. It's it's really it's it's moralist, but actually you still absolutely selfish. It's really which is very interesting as a concept. The the, the it even goes back, I think, to Adam's fist, like the invisible hand. Everybody cares about themselves, but in the end, it will be the best outcome possible for the market. Here, it's kind of the same. You really care just about yourself, but then you you just have this this okay. If others behave exactly like me it will be costly for me. So actually I will change my behavior. If I just put, don't put this uh, in the trash and everybody does it, it's, it's very costly for myself. I think yeah, you know, although for me, if I only think about myself, yeah. oh, it's annoying to go to the trash bin. Trash bin so I just right, like, right. Yeah. go ahead, Bursa. And, and yeah, like, like, uh, like this homo moralis uh, preference can really explain a lot. We talk about environmental protection, like recycling, purchasing green electricity, but then can, can be applied to other topics, we have a paper actually about um, contribution to Wikipedia, online uh, on encyclopedia, you know, like um, like this, um, uh, how is it called, like Stack Overflow? Uh, you know, yeah, when you share like your, online your databases, code or experience. Yeah. Exactly, so you will share, you know, it takes some time to share your knowledge. Uh, it takes some effort uh, and basically like it's for the benefit of other kind of, but if everybody is doing this, you know, like society is, is better off and you will get back some knowledge. So it's great. So morality can explain a lot, but I, I, it's, I think it's also important to say that it cannot explain it all. You know, it's not like a, it's still another model, a very useful one for certain applications, but it, it's not the perfect model that will explain everything. Uh, and for instance, when you, you think about uh, donation like uh, charity donation or donation I don't know if you meet someone in the street you know asking for money and you give him some money or something it morality cannot explain this behavior so in this case you know you would have to think about maybe altruism or I don't know maybe something maybe inequity aversion I don't know but uh, morality in this specific example does not work because uh, it's like you like if you think what is happening if everybody is giving money to this guy well, it does not affect you, you know, like it affects uh, that person, that person will be much better off, but it does not affect you. So that's why in this case, you know, maybe you need altruism, maybe you need something else. So it's only kind of part of the equation and, and depending on the application and what you want to do, what you want to understand, uh, you, you need to navigate kind of and decide on different models. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also the beauty of economics. You know, you have this mm -hmm. toolbox and, and different models. and. Yeah. and uh, that's very cool. I think that's kind of a reality in science. We can think about people think, okay, it's a social science. It's really weird to represent preference of people with mathematical functions, but maybe with something that speaks or convince them more that you can represent it mathematically, you can go in physics. And then you're like, well, when you try to explain the movement of planets, you are, we are, you are with general relativity, but indeed other, it, it does not explain everything, right? If you go at the subatomic level and you want to explain the neutron, proton, 
on the quarks behavior, you have another theory. And, 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 and physicists are actually fighting since a long time to try to unify those. And, and here we actually pass kind of this step at the, at the moment because it seems way too complicated here. And most importantly, not necessarily useful to unify because basically in different contexts, you will apply different model that fits well the, the situation. In, indeed, as, as we were speaking, as you were speaking, I was really thinking, what about homo moralis for the, the basic model of microeconomics with demand function? We really don't care. It, it's, it's useless in that context, or at least I don't see why it will improve the, the prediction of the model. It doesn't work in that, that, that realm, but, but, that's, but that's fine. That's fine. I think your parallel with physics is, is fascinating. It's amazing. And, and that's also one thing I love with Boris is like, we often, when we're talking, I mean, in, he will recognize that like we start talking about quantum physics and stuff and I think it's an amazing it's an amazing example that you're giving because uh, I remember like when we studied quantum physics uh, so if you try to apply Newtonian physics uh, to like as you said like uh, either like very cold or very small or like subatomic particles it doesn't work right like everything everything is like flawed it doesn't work and so like you would say oh Newtonian physics is not the good model, right? It's not good, it's, it's, it shouldn't be used. And you said like a lot of people try to like combine both, like adding like a quantum interaction to Newtonian physics, but these models like are not useful at all because they put too many things and in the end they don't explain anything because they contain too many elements. And in the end what you end up doing is like in these models is like, yeah, like the quantum element when you have like uh, big stuff is just like negligible. So yeah, why are you putting it in the first yeah. place? You don't need it. Yeah. And then the other way around, when you're looking at quantum things, the Newtonian element is like not very useful. Except so there's what we call- Except in singularities, right? <laughs> huh? Except in singularities, that, that's the- <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. So, and there's like this thing that they call like the limit of classical physics. And so you just like can look like, okay, what's the limit? If I'm beyond it, I just use the toolbox of quantum physics. If I'm before it, I'll just use yeah. Newtonian physics. And as you said, if you go to another level, you also need to use relativity. Yeah. And so definitely there's like different models. As you said, like why think... use homo moralis for, for like looking at the demand on the market? It doesn't matter so much to look at the demand on market of apples, I but it matters what, for uh, electricity. Uh, well, what makes what makes economics very different than physics in this case it's when you pick your model there is a part of subjectivity i think it's important to recognize that you know we all have, have our bias and uh, mm -hmm. preconception about the world and when we decide on a model i mean we bring those conception into it you know it's not like uh, for instance i don't know depending on the um, it's like, uh, what is it called, like in uh, physics, like depending on the um, distance, you know, like the size of uh, what you're looking at, maybe you, yeah. you switch between model or the other. Here, it's it's really, no, it depends on what you also believe in a sense. Like, mm -hmm. And that's and what you want to look at also. Thing. Yeah. No, the, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, no, just indeed. to say, like, I'm not saying <laughs> physics and economics are the same thing, and I would never <laughs> say that. Uh, I think if you want to just keep this discussion, because it's a very classical discussion among economists, I think there are two things that will never be found in, in economics that are found in physics. It's the invariance of time and space. You take a particle, like a molecule, or like an atom of carbon, uh, in uh, Australia, uh, in the 18th century, it's the same as a particle of carbon in France uh, today which is not the case in econ. Like the context varies a lot of things, varies as we said, like the level of morality, the utility, et cetera. So invariance of time and space are not yeah. to be found in economics. So definitely there will be choices to be made. It's not comparable, but just to say that, yeah, different, like if we accept the difference in models in physics, we can also accept it in economics. But that's also what makes economics so fascinating. You know, it's like people are learning. So I don't know, if you tell them, oh, you behave this way, and then you know, they will know that. So maybe they will act differently. So you, know, you have all this feedback. So uh, yeah, it's always changing, always learning. And, and mm -hmm. that's a mm -hmm. very evolving science in a sense. Yeah. That's why it's, it's very interesting. But if, if, even if it's uh, like you decide which model to take, well, you, you build on the previous literature. So you kind of have ideas why it's important. Then you have, I don't know, like the, the the paper you, you mentioned uh, from Weibull and co-author, it's 
Well, you take a range of, of those models and you try to see which fits better, which happens as well. Sometimes you have the clear answer. You know that you are now with uh, Homo economicus. Sometimes you, you work on something new. So you can also do what we call robustness or, or comparative, or you just compare uh, the dynamics if you play with different models. And here, that's exactly what they do. They, they try to pinpoint in, in this new type of game, uh, with type of games we are used in game theory, which model seems to fit better reality and and then you find the answer kind of relatively clearly. So, so that. It's it's by Mittenen and co-author. So Weibull is a co-author on it, but the, the first author is Mittenen. Ah, thank just, you. Just yeah, I just remember sense. here because he he was our teacher and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We I mean, could provide the links. Yeah, yeah exactly. Also, no, yeah, we, we, no, we'll put your papers and, and, uh, and those as well uh, uh, below. Very, very important uh, to do yeah, that. Yeah, but jumping on what you're saying, I think, um, so like there's this experiment but I think data in general is very interesting. So with Boris, I think like the first time we thought of applying it to environmental econ is, is like with this like purchasing green electricity thing. You know, we were like, we would pay more for green electricity for starters, but we know a lot of people who would. And we ended up also actually doing a master project with an EPFL student, uh, running a survey over all EPFL uh, community uh, to, to ask them if they're willing to pay more for green electricity. And, and we found like huge levels. So people, and there's actually so many studies. So, so much data showing that people are sometimes like the premium is around 20%. People are ready to pay 20% more electricity bill to ensure that they have more uh, green electricity in their mix. How, how reliable is it to ask people rather to on a survey compared to they will implement? You so know? We, we did a survey, but the, the data I'm telling you with 20%, like in Korea, in Spain, are based on actual data. Wow, OK, OK. So, so I agree. <laughs> we, we find much more than 20%. So people are probably over, <laughs> yeah, like overstating. Now, sure. And it's also a biased population, I mean, you know. But what was also very interesting in this survey, because you say, oh, reliable is it? Actually, we realized by looking at the answer that people really had a low perception of what was the reality, like, like misperception of what was the reality. For instance, they were like, oh, that would be great if we can purchase green electricity. But the thing is, like in Switzerland, it's already the case by default also that in your electricity mix, you will pay for green electricity. And they, they were not aware of that. You know, they said, mm. oh, that would be great. And no, actually, yeah, it's already the case. You're already, you're already it. paying it, you know? <laughs> and so that was interesting to see. Like there were lots of uh, things like that, that mm -hmm. you could tell that like people are not well informed actually about uh, environmental question. And there, there, are, there is another paper actually that was about Swiss citizen and I mean, Swiss, it's a, uh, you know, developed country, educated population, lots of awareness of environmental issues, but still there were lots of misperception and misconception about environmental issues. And, and that's something I think uh, if we want to make people behave in a more environmental friendly way is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, I think that's something super interesting in our model. I mean, I'm not selling our model. I'm just saying <laughs> that if you look at homo economicus, so we started with homo economicus, right? And you take the environmental change problem. So Boris was talking about it. So there are two, two main aspects. The first one is you think about yourself only and what you get. And the second one is that even if, like, let's suppose you care about the environment, if you're thinking in terms of homo economicus, if you take the bike to work, your bike to work, or you go by a four by four, you have what we call, like, it's called atomicity. You have almost zero impact. Like, it's not going to change climate change. Uh, if you mm -hmm. go by bike or by a four by four. So why the hell are you taking your bike if you're more comfortable in this like four, big four by four? And morality answers that because it says alone, I have no impact. But if everybody takes a bike like I do, then there will be an impact. And and, and that's what I, what I think is, uh, is, is interesting about it. It's like the awareness of like the impact that a community can have is really important. So like in a classical model, like whether you know how bad the situation is in terms of CO2 emissions, or if you're totally ignorant about it, your behavior is the same. But if you think in terms of homo moralis, then knowing what's happening and what's the impact makes a huge difference because you think collectively, you think, wait, what would happen if everybody did like me? And as Boris was saying, actually, so like maybe it doesn't explain charity so well, but it explains voting, for example. If like an election was never decided on one vote. So if you're just thinking about yourself, your vote is not gonna make a difference. Your vote, you can look at all the elections over the last, I don't know, 100 years, your vote is not gonna make a difference. 
But what you think is, if everybody votes like me, the person I'm voting for is going to win. <laughs> so, so, so we think morally in terms of voting. So I think for voting, actually, it explains a lot of behavior because you're thinking, yeah, everybody does like me. Some people think that their vote won't, won't make a difference and generally they don't vote. So, you know, <laughs> so heterogeneity, like so, some people are kind of, yeah, no, it does not matter mm -hmm. and they don't vote. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that's like yeah, the normal way. That it, applies, uh, it applies to <laughs> Wikipedia. Like you say, if I write an article about what I know, I'm going to write an article about robust standard errors because uh, I know about it. And then you're like, yeah, it's good because the person who knows about uh, cluster standard errors is going to write an article about it. And so... <laughs> Eventually, it's going to come back to me because if everybody writes a Wikipedia article about what they know, so it explains Wikipedia, it explains green purchasing, voting. So that's, I think, what's nice about this model. That's perfect because you always answer the questions before I ask because that was exactly what I wanted to know, right? We, we talk about environments and, and I was like, well, but where does it useful and representative of, of reality and where should we apply the, those models? And, and you gave perfectly good answers about Wikipedia or voting. Is, is there other you, you have in mind or, or those are really... Basically, good, good? The, the short answer is any social dilemma. So any cases where individuals uh, can, can cooperate but it's, it's costly to do so. So they have incentives to not to cooperate. And any case is kind of, of a social dilemma and there are plenty uh, in the world we live in, like this model could be applied. Is there research- Yeah, it could be among firms. It could be like, you have a lot of like potential applications. Is there research as how could we influence the, the moral parameter basically? Because if you, let's say that the outcome is way better if the, the moral parameter is, is jump up. So actually the policy recommendation will be change that, right? And it could be through, I don't know, information. Uh, as you said, I, I'm not sure it's linked to that. So, so I'm turning to you, you too. Uh, is it linked to that information? Because you said like people would like to pay to use this uh, pay for uh, green energy, but they are already doing it. Or maybe they don't really capture. I mean, for the environment, it's quite a clear thing. It's, it's very hard to understand exactly what's the implication of your choice. You want to, to, to consume uh, local food, fair enough, but then it's maybe grown under in Switzerland. I mean, during the winter, it depends what you eat. It, even if it's local, it's maybe use tons of energy to grow something here. Or maybe in Spain, it's less costly in energy, but you have to move the thing. So it's very, very complex questions that even if you look into this very deeply, it's hard to answer. But well, uh, to make it short, uh, can we, is there a literature about that? Or what do you think about influencing with policy recommendation, the morality parameters? And, and is it related to information? Boris, do you want to? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. That's a very, very good point. Uh, and first, I must say, like, you know, because you say, like, for instance, environmental issues, it's very hard to know. And I mean, I did bachelor, master in environmental sciences, and then again, PhD working on these issues. And if you ask me what's best between, I don't know, purchasing these uh, potatoes produced in this uh, local farm or that one produced, I don't know, somewhere else, I, I cannot exactly tell, you know, it's, it's super hard. You, you don't really know. It depends on how it was produced, so energy input, uh, chemicals, etc. It's not a simple answer, actually. And, and that's why actually we, I mean, they, they started to implement labels and certificates kind of to help consumer, like to kind of fight this asymmetry of information between the producers and consumer. And, and so that's a very important part for, at least for environmental issues, like to really uh, improve kind of the environmental awareness and like knowledge. Uh, but indeed, like influencing the morality kind of of the population it would be also kind of ideal, you know, like if everybody was more moral, then it will improve the situation. And it's something generally in a economics, many people are kind of, um, they don't like that we change the utility function. You know, they, they like to say, okay, we have this preference. It's kind of, I don't know, from the genes or whatever it's, it's given. Because when you start to modify the, like the morality parameter, for instance, you change the utility function. Well, you kind of get the result that you would like, you know, it's, uh, it's like you can kind of tweak, tweak your model and, and get the, the results you want and and so that's why people would like to have this uh, fixed uh, utility still in our paper we actually do that <laughs> to 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 explain a few things and one thing that we 
that, uh, like uh, an, imp an observation that uh, we observe in many contexts is that sometimes when you introduce a financial incentive, uh, the financial incentive will worsen the situation. So imagine, uh, actually, there is this famous paper about, uh, I mean, I guess, Charles, you can talk about it, actually, you know, you know it better. Yeah. Easy and Ristichini 2000. We can also put it uh, as a reference. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I just complimenting on what I think Boris like said it all. Um, so, so, so there's like two aspects, like what you're, what you're saying, like you could, you could like take a given morality level in the population and work on just people being more aware. So just like with the same level of morality. So like, that's what, as Boris was saying, what a proper economist would say, like your morality or like your UT function is immaculate. You don't touch it. And then you work on like, reducing the cost to do things because the homo morales still has like a, mm -hmm. an economic side. Uh, so like you want to reduce I the cost. See. So I make see. it easier to recycle, make it cheaper to buy green electricity, et cetera. To or like make it easier. Exactly. Education, like make it easier for people to know how to write the Wikipedia article, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you can work on the social awareness. So tell people, you know, that's like a million people uh, reads a P Wikipedia page if you write one. Uh, you know that uh, actually, uh, like if we all uh, use green electricity, we would like save that much CO2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like, so you work on more like the social benefit and the individual cost, not touching the morality. But then there are things that touch the morality. So like you could, so that's like the less economic side of it that Boris was talking about you could change the, the morality degree in the population. And that's more related to like social interactions, et cetera. And one key thing is like, in what mindset are the people? So like, I think like a good example to start with, and then I will talk about the Gnesi and Ristikini paper. <laughs> Suppose, I think it's something that happened to us all somehow in a way, you're on the road and you have a flat tire. You, you need to change your tire. Mm. It's very complicated. You look at people walking in the street and you're like, oh, would you please help me with my tire? Homo economicus would say, that's a cost. I get nothing from it. Not going to do it. But it seems, it, it's, you look at like actually what happens and like 90% of people actually do it if you just ask them. So it seems that people like have this sense of morality. They're like, oh, I want people to help me when I have a flat tire. So I am helping them so that if everybody acts like me and helps the people with flat tires, the day I, am, I have a flat tire, people will help me out. So I'm thinking about myself. So that's why I help. But what, what's super interesting is that if you start telling people on the street, like, oh, I would pay you $10 if you help me with my flat tire, you would have only like very few people accepting. So like, if it's like, if you're just asking them for help, they would, they would help like 90%. If you give them money, they won't, which like economic theory is mesmerized about it. like what? Like you get to repair the tire and get money and you don't want to do it. You get just to repair the tire. You want to do it like that's absurd. And that's where the model is actually interesting. And so that's what Boris was saying is that like introducing financial incentives kind of like changes the way you think about things. So you start thinking like, wait, $10, that's not much for an hour of my time or two hours of my time. I want a hundred dollars. And so like, if you want to reach the same level of helping people, you need to increase the price a lot. Mm -hmm. And so like the, the, the other experiment very quickly, I don't want to spend too long, but just is about like daycare. So they look at parents arriving late at the daycare. So that's Agnesia and Ristikini paper. You can look at it more in detail. They realized pe parents were arriving late. And so they were like, oh, let's just make them pay for every minute. So $1 for every minute you're late. And they were like, okay, this is a financial cost. People will stop coming late. And what they observe is that the opposite happened is that by introducing financial incentives, people were feeling really horrible because from a moral perspective, they were like, if everybody comes late like me, like it's like, like, like the society is like dysfunctioning and I will pay for it mm -hmm. also at some point. So like morally, it's like not good. Mm -hmm. And so like when you introduce like the financial incentive, people are like, oh yeah, I'm just paying for it. So like mm -hmm. they're getting $1 for every minute. So people started becoming much, much later. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like what we call like crowding out moral incentives by introducing financial incentives. Mm -hmm. So we should be very, very careful when like we talk about carbon tax, uh, financial subsidies for using things. It's great. And these are like very powerful, but we should be careful where to introduce them. Maybe at things where people are not aware or like, as you said, like carbon tax people are just not aware. So like maybe like, let's just tax it because 
then it will create a cost for them. But for things where people are willing like to recycle, for example, maybe it's not a good idea to tax them because like then they would like not care about recycling. They would just be like, oh, I'm paying for my thing. Yeah. So who cares? And uh, yeah, that's that's also important aspect because generally in economics and especially in environmental economics, uh, we say, okay, what should we do? Wait, we should put a tax, you know, we should put the CO2 mm-hmm. tax on. Mm-hmm. And actually would say, say eh, depends like, okay, so it might improve the situation in some cases, but be careful, mm-hmm. you know, because it, mm-hmm. in some cases it might not. And like, uh, like okay, so we said these financial incentives can crowd out these moral motives. Actually, the, you can also have the opposite in a sense, you could increase the morality. And one way it's again, education, because there are some papers showing that when children are playing cooperative games, well, they will act in a more selfish way. So, you know, by just changing the way we teach, changing the way we learn about things, playing cooperative games, well, you also change the behavior. So in a way you can change maybe the, the preference of people by changing how you, you teach them. Mm-hmm. There's actually so a much different possibilities. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. A very sad example uh, that was done with econ graduates. <laughs> what was it? Uh, so they asked people before they entered uh, economics. Uh, so they, they, I forgot the name of the paper, uh, but they, they, they asked people getting into an economics bachelor before, like they make them like play some games. Uh, cooperative games and they found people were quite like cooperative etc uh, you see like in cooperative games for random population it's between 40 and 60 percent cooperation so people are like quite willing to cooperate mm-hmm. which homo economicus would say it should be zero like it's like a prisoner's dilemma uh, like you wouldn't want to cooperate because like it's not good for yourself but what they see is that getting out of like economics bachelor the proportion of cooperation goes down because in economics bachelor, you probably taught like, you know, homo economicus, you're selfish. So it just, I mean, it's not the best of examples, but it's just a way to show that, yes, definitely you can affect the preferences of people mm-hmm. uh, just by like education, the way you tell them, the way you frame things. Yeah, you have some, yeah. you have some studies in psychology where like by talking about money, you know, like talking people money, then they act in a more selfish way. Just mm-hmm. the simple effect of thinking about, you know, Charles, you mentioned like, like when you think about preparing a tire and if you start thinking, okay, how much money is that? You know, is mm-hmm. it worth my effort and all that? Then you act in a more selfish way. Mm-hmm. So you have plenty actually of evidence of, of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I think the, the benefits are, are completely change the, in which the, the origin basically. It's like with blood donation or things like this. You, you want to do it for, for a benefit that's either you can tell it's, it, it's moral, either it's really it gives you a good perception of yourself that will be just going out away from those utility functions. That's my understanding of that. Basically, you can also say, but it's selfish in the end because actually you're helping him because it makes you feel good about yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror and you like you because you act in such a way. So in the end, it's, it's, it's as well a bit selfish. And, and, uh, and, and when actually, you say- there are some... Uh... So sorry, so it's just exactly on that. There are some uh, evidence in uh, biology that it's actually what is happening. Like they, they, they make people like behave in a nicely way, you know, for instance, give uh, something to someone else. And they actually observe some changes in the temperature of the body, you know, like kind of a, a warm glow, which is also another concept sometimes used in economics. Like, like you feel happy or you feel some joys about giving and you can really observe that from a biological point of view, like in the, in the brain of people, you know, there is change in activity and all that. So it's, it's very fascinating. Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know that there was research, but actually, I'm, I'm not surprised. Indeed, it's, it's really a, a key again, beha- again behavior that I guess we, we experience uh, as humans. So, so I think, and, and then basically, if you give money, you, are, you, you, you don't have this vision of yourself. Now you have, you receive money, so you 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 cut the benefits of increasing your perception and your vision of yourself. Now you enter, as you say, it's really a contract. Now you have to work and give your time. So how how much does it cost? And it's completely different uh, incentives and value of time. So it's uh, but it's very interesting to to navigate between the two. Well, one one last question that I was really yeah, just just one thing yeah, that I think ahead. is interesting yeah. because we didn't talk about it at all, and I think it's a key thing, especially when we talk about environment mental changes is firms and companies. And so like just to, to, to translate it to, um, to like a firm, uh, there's a lot of firms that like um, actually started emitting more when they bought the, so there's like the emission trading scheme 
when they bought the permits to emit CO2. And it's like, because it became like a right to pollute. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, but I paid for my yeah. CO2, you know? Yeah. And for some companies, it's a very small price to pay yeah. for this CO2. And so it's kind of like, and actually when they communicate about it, if you look at these like greenwashing and like the um, social CSR, corporate social responsibility, they say like, you know, we bought like this amount of permits. We're super green. Like, like, you know, they buy kind of like, like they buy a conscious to themselves because they got like this right to pollute. But at the end of the day, they polluted more. So like they had this more, like kind of moral pressure not to pollute that they lost by paying for it. Mm -hmm. So it's just to say that, of course, it applies to warm glow to personal satisfaction, but also it applies to firms. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. had the last point, sorry. No, sure, sure. It's it's very important to to raise this point, and I think it's it's absolutely central. We were talking about the environment. CO two is a major threat and discussion uh, in, the, in the policies, and and this is a key part. Why, right? It's it's usually argued. Well, the the price of those CO two on the CO two market of, of bonds is uh, undervalued. So basically, it's just a right to pollute for. Uh, rich uh, companies and, and hence it's, it's not uh, it's not suitable at all so 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 i think it's, it's very it's highly central but linked to this actually my last point was is it always the outcome will be always better for society if you increase the morality or can it be a negative has have negative impact in the end in some way in some context at some level yeah, there could be some Do you want to talk about Russia, Boris? Cases. Yeah, I think that's uh, I mean, Russia or any like it's it's some very specific cases because you know, we said homo moralis they're kind of in a way selfish, uh, they value what will happen to them. So, let's let's say about climate change. What is very difficult also with climate change is that the impacts they are differentiated depending on the countries. Uh, yep especially in the short or medium term, some countries are negatively affected, affected and some might benefit. I mean, not in the long term, but in the medium term, yep. some countries might benefit a bit yep. from an increase in temperature. For instance, if you countries that are in the north, like Russia and uh, maybe Canada, well, actually it might be good for them, you know, mm. uh, if the temperature increase a bit, because maybe it will free some, uh, like they can improve their agriculture production. They, I don't know. They have Start doing wine. Positive. Yeah, exactly. Why not? So there could be some positive impact in a way. Again, medium term, not long term. So for them, actually, if they are moral, the best way is to pollute more. Because like, if everybody is polluting, like emitting more CO2, then they will benefit from that. So, but in this case, you know, it's not anymore a social dilemma in a sense, because they would benefit. Normally, a social dilemma is like you benefit when you cooperate, uh, but that's costly. In this case, it's not a social dilemma. It's like you benefit by actually defecting. And but yeah, like if you increase morality, you could have this effect, uh, which would not be the case with altruism, because altruism, you care about the other. So if you have negative impact, then you, you would not do it. That's also an important, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like maybe a difference to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think Boris brought like the two elements that are important. The, the the first one is is like um like like what do you get yourself is it a social dilemma or not so the the short answer is that if you, morality is always better in a social dilemma so in the case of russia it wouldn't be a social dilemma social dilemma meaning that if everybody acts this way it's better for you but for you it's actually more costly to do it that's a social dilemma so like your individual incentive is not mm -hmm. aligned with the social interest and i think the, the the second element that boris brings in that's super important that we already mentioned is is awareness because like he said it many times and i think it's super important you should tell russians it's not good for you in the long term that global warming arrives because it's gonna like create more like uh, uh, catastrophic climate events etc etc so like if they're really aware of the impact then it will become a social dilemma again for them and then they will be pushed to actually reduce their emissions but if they're convinced that it's better for them, then it's a different story. That's also an important fact with actually climate change. It's like, okay, we start to feel some impacts today, but most of the impacts are long-term. So actually, if you value uh, only the present, you don't care about the future, then it does not matter if you're moral or not. Because if you care only about the present, then you know why would, make, why would you make effort for something that would have impact in the future? No, mm -hmm. you, you would not. So you can be fully moral and still actually not behave in an environmental friendly way, even if you're fully aware of the problem and et cetera, because for instance, you might be like have a strong preference for, for the present. 
that, that's one possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of areas for future research, including also intertemporal <laughs> preferences. Yeah, exactly. That discounting factors include that in, in this, basically. But that, that's a very good point. That's true. It's really a, as well linked to that. It's basically, you have this morality, but uh, if you consider that everything happens at once, like you have one period of time and, and what you do will impact at the same time the others and so on. Because then if it's not the case, you have this other dimen dimension that that's complicates the, the, the stuff, I guess, if you have time discounting. Basically, if it's tomorrow, if it's one week, if it's in 10 years, if it's in the hundreds, it affects less and less myself and hence my behavior. Well, that was a very good way, I guess, to... To, to open uh, and close, but as well to open the, the thinking and the research about that. So thanks a lot and uh, have a nice day too.